Kuei had received a message from his old friend Kujo and didn't know how he would answer it. That night, he pretended the heat was keeping him awake. An easy lie, for he was drenched in sweat, but then, when wasn't he sweating? It was so hot and humid in the bush that he felt like he was being slowly roasted for supper. He missed the castle, the breeze from the beach. Here in the village of his mother, Afia, sweat pooled in his ears and his belly button. His skin itched, and he imagined mosquitoes crawling up his feet to his legs, to his stomach, to rest at the watering hole of his navel. Did mosquitoes drink sweat, or was it only blood? Blood. He pictured the prisoners being brought into the cellars by tens and twenties, their hands and feet bound and bleeding. He wasn't made for this. He was supposed to have an easier life, away from the workings of slavery. He was raised among the whites in Cape Coast, educated in England. He should still be in his office in the castle, working as a writer, the junior officer rank that his father, James Collins, had secured for him before his death logging numbers that he could pretend didn't represent people bought and sold. Instead, the castle's new governor had summoned him, sent him here to the bush. As you know by now, Quay, we have a long-standing working relationship with the Biku Badu and the others of his village. But of late, we have only heard that they've begun trading with a few private companies. We would like you to set up an outpost in the village that would act as a residence for a few of our employees as a way of say, gently reminding our friends that they have a certain trade obligation to our company. You have been specially requested for the position, and given your parents' history with the village, given your comfort and familiarity with the language and local customs, we thought that you might be a particular asset to the company while there. Quay had nodded and accepted the position, because what else could he do? But inside, he resisted. His comfort and familiarity with the local customs, his parents' history with the village, Quay was still in Afia's womb the last time he or his mother had been there, so scared was she of Baba. That was in 1779, nearly 20 years ago. Baba had died in those years, and yet, still, they had stayed away. Quay felt his new job was kind of a punishment, and he hadn't been punished, hadn't he been punished enough? The sun finally came up, and Quay went to see his uncle Fifi. When they'd met for the first time only a month before, Quay could hardly believe what a man like Fifi was related to him. It wasn't that he was handsome. If Fia had been called the beauty her whole life, and so Quay was accustomed to beauty, it was that Fifi looked powerful, his body a graceful alliance of muscles. Quay had taken after his father, skinny and tall, but not particularly strong. James was powerful, but his power had come from his pedigree, the Collinses of Liverpool, who gained their wealth building slave ships. His mother, mother's power, came from her beauty, but Afia's power came from, but Fifi's power came from his body, from the fact that he looked like he could take anything he wanted. Quay had known only one other person like that. Ah, my son, you are welcome here, Fifi said when he saw Quay approaching. Sit, eat. Summoned, the house girl came out with two bowls. She started to set one bowl in front of Fifi, but he stopped her with only a glance. You must serve my son first. Sorry, she mumbled setting a bowl in front of Quay instead. Quay thanked her and looked down at the porridge. Uncle, we've been here a month already, and yet you still haven't discussed our trade agreements. The company has money to buy more, much more, but sh you have to let us. You have to stop trading with any other company. Quay had given this very speech, or one like it, many times before, but his uncle Fifi always ignored him. The first night they were there, Quay had wanted to talk to Badu about the grade trade agreements straight away. He thought the sooner he could get the chief to agree, the sooner he could leave. That night, Badu had invited all the men to drink at his compound. He brought them enough wine and apatsuki to drown in. Timothy Hightower, an officer eager to impress the chief, drank half a caskful of a home brew before he passed out underneath the palm tree, shaking and vomiting and claiming to see spirits. Soon, the rest of the men also littered the forest of Badu's front yard, vomiting or sleeping or searching for a local woman to sleep with. Quay waited for his chance to speak to Badu, sipping his drink all the while. He had only two cups of wine before Fifi approached him. Careful, Quay, Fifi said, pointing at the scene of the men before them. Stronger men than these have been brought down by too much drink. Quay looked at the cup in Fifi's hand, his eyebrow raised. Water, Fifi said. One of us must be ready for anything. He motioned to Badu, who had fallen asleep in his gold throne, his chin nestled down into the round flesh of his belly. Quay laughed, and Fifi cracked a smile, the first that Quay had seen since meeting him. Quay never talked to Badu that night, but as the weeks went on, he learned that it was not Badu he needed to praise. Please. 
While Abiku Badu was a figurehead, the Oman Hin, who received gifts from the political leaders of London and Holland alike for his role in their trade, Fifi was the authority. When he shook his head, the whole village stopped. Now, Fifi was as silent as he was every other time Quay had brought up trade with the British. He looked out in the forest in front of them, and Quay followed his gaze. In the trees, two vibrant birds sang loudly a discordant song. Uncle, the agreement Badu made with my father. Do you hear that? Fifi asked, pointing to the birds. Frustrated, Quay nodded. When one bird stops, the other starts. Each time their song gets louder, shriller. Why do you think that is? Uncle, trade is the only reason why we're here. If you want the British out of your village, you have to... What you cannot hear, Quay, is the third bird. She is quiet. Quiet. Listening to the male birds get louder and louder still. And when they have sung their voices out, then and only then will she speak up. Then and only then will she choose the man whose song she liked better. For now, she sits and lets them argue. Who will be the better partner? Who will give her better seed? Who will fight for her when times are difficult? Quay, this village must conduct its business like that female bird. You want to pay more for slaves? Pay more. But know that the Dutch will also pay more. And the Portuguese and even the pirates will pay more too. And while you are all shouting about how much better you are than the others, I will be sitting quietly in my compound, eating my fufu, and waiting for the price I think is right. Now, let us not speak of business any more. Quay sighed. So, he would be here forever. The birds had stopped singing. Perhaps they sensed his exasperation. He looked at them, their blue, yellow, orange wings, their hooked beaks. There were no birds like this in London, Quay said softly. There was no color. Everything was gray. The sky, the buildings, even the people looked gray. Fifi shook his head. I don't know why Athea let James send you to that nonsense country. Quay nodded absently and returned the porridge in his bowl. Quay had been a lonely child. When he was born, his father built a hut close to the castle so that he, Athea, and Quay could live more comfortably. In those days, trade had been prosperous. Quay never saw the dungeons, and he had only the faintest idea of what went on in the lower levels of the castle, but he knew that business was good because he rarely saw his father. Every day was for him and Effia. She was the most patient mother in all of Cape Coast, in all of the Gold Coast. She spoke softly, yet assuredly. She never hit him. Even when the other mothers taunted her, telling her that she would spoil him and that he would never learn. Learn what? Effia would answer. What did I ever learn from Baba? And yet, Quay did learn. He sat in Effia's lap as she taught him to speak, speaking a word in both Fanti and English until Quay could hear in one language and answer in the other. She had only learned how to read and write herself the first year of Quay's life. And yet she taught him with vigor, holding his small, fat fists in hers as they traced lines and lines together. How smart you are, she ex exclaimed, when Quay learned to spell his name without her help. In eight, 1784, on Quay's fifth birthday, Afia first told him about her own childhood in Badu's village. He learned all of the names, Kobe, Baba, Fifi. He learned there was another mother whose name they would never know about the shimmering black stone Effia always wore about her neck that belonged to this woman, his true grandmother. Telling this story, Effia's face darkened, but the storm passed when Quay reached up and touched her cheek. You are my own child, she said, mine. And she was his. When he was young, that had been enough, but as he grew older, he began to lament the fact that his family was so small. Unlike all the other families in the Gold Coast, where siblings piled up on top of siblings in the steady stream of marriages each powerful man consummated, he wished that he could meet his father's other children, those white Collinses who lived across the Atlantic, but he knew it would never be. Quay only had himself, his books, the beach, the castle, his mother. I'm worried because he has no friends, if he had said to James one day. He doesn't play with the other castle children. Quay had almost stepped in the in the door after a day of building sandcastle replicas of Cape Coast Castle when he heard Afia mention his name, and so he had remained outside to listen. What are we supposed to do about that? You've coddled him, Afia. He's got to learn to do some things on his own. He should be playing with the other Fonti children, village children, so he can get away from here from time to time. Don't you know anyone? I'm home, Quay announced, perhaps a bit too noisily not wanting to hear what his father would say next. By the end of the day, he'd forgotten all about it, but weeks later, when Kujo Saki came with his father to visit the castle, Quay remembered his parents' conversation. Kujo 
fa Cujo's father, was the chief of a prominent Fanti village. He was Abiku Badu's biggest competitor, and he had begun meeting with James Collins to discuss increasing trade when the governor asked him if he might bring his eldest son to one of their meetings. Kwe, this is Cujo, James said, giving Kwe a small push towards the boy. You two play while we talk. Kwe and Cujo watched their fathers walk off to a different side of the castle. Once they could hardly make them out anymore, Cujo turned his attention to Kwe. Are you white? Cujo had asked him, touching his hair. Kwe recoiled at Cujo's touch, though many others had done the same thing, asked him the same question. I'm not white, he said softly. What? Speak up, Cujo said. And so Kwe had repeated himself, nearly shouting. From the distance, the boy's father turned to observe the commotion. Not so loud, Kwe, James said. Kwe could feel color flood into his cheeks, but Cujo had just looked on, clearly amused. So you're not white. What are you? I'm like you, Kwe said. Cujo held out his hand and demanded that Kwe could do the same. Until they were standing arm to arm, skin touching skin. Not like me, Cujo said. Kwe had wanted to cry, but that desire embarrassed him. He knew that he was one of the half-caste children of the castle, and like the other half-caste children, he could not fully claim either half of himself, neither his father's whiteness, nor his mother's blackness, neither England nor the Gold Coast. Cujo must have seen the tears fighting to escape Kwe's eyes. Come now he said, grabbing Quay's hand. My father says they keep big guns here. Show me where. Though he'd asked Quay to show him, Cujo was the one who began to lead the way, running until the two boys had zipped past their fathers towards the cannons. It was in this way that Quay and Cujo became friends. Two weeks after the day first day they met, Quay had received a message from Cujo asking if he would like to visit his village. Can I go? Quay asked his mother, but Ethia was already pun pushing him out the door, overjoyed at the prospect of a friend. Cujo, was the first visit village that Quay had ever spent a lot of time in, and he was amazed at how different it was from the castle and from Cape Coast. There was not even one white person there, no soldiers to say what they could or could not do. Though the children were no strangers to beatings, they were still rowdy, loud, and free. Cujo, who was eleven like Quay, was already the oldest of ten children, and he ordered his siblings about as though they were his tiny army. "'Go and fetch my friend something to eat,' he shouted at his younger sister when he saw Quay approaching." The girl was but a toddler, thumb still inseparable from mouth, but she always did as Coach Cujo said, and soon, as he said it. "'Hey, Quay, look what I found,' Cujo said, hardly waiting for Quay to reach him before opening his palm. Two small snails were in his hands, their tiny, slimy bod bodies wriggling between Cujo's fingers. "'This one's yours, and this one's mine,' Cujo said, pointing them out. "'Let's race them.' Cujo closed his palm against, again and started to run. His was faster, and Quay had a hard time keeping up. But when they got to a clearing in the forest, Cujo got down on his stomach and motioned for Quay to do the same. He gave Quay his snail, then marked a line in the dirt as a starting point. The two boys put their snails behind the line, then released them. At first, neither snail moved. Are they stupid? Cujo asked, prodding his snail with his index finger. You're free, stupid snails. Go, go. Maybe they're just shocked, Quay said, and Cujo looked at him like he was the one who was stupid. But then Quay's snail started to move past the line, followed seconds later by Cujo's snail. Quay's snail didn't move like a snail usually did, slowly and deliberately. It was as though he knew he was racing, as though he knew he was free. It didn't take long for the boys to lose sight of him, while Cujo's snail ambled along, even turning in a circle several times. Suddenly, Quay was nervous. Maybe Cujo would be angry at his loss and tell him to leave the village and never come back. Quay had only met, just met Cujo, but already he knew that he did not want to lose him. He did the only thing he could think to do. He stuck out his hand as often as he'd seen his father do after business deals, and to his surprise, Cujo took it. The boys shook. My snail was very stupid, but yours did well, Cujo said. Yes, mine did very well, Quay agreed, relieved. We should name them. We'll call mine Richard, because it's a British name, and he was bad, like the British are bad. Yours can be named Kwame. Quay laughed. Yes, Richard is bad like the British, he said. He forgot in that second that his own father was British, and when he remembered later, he realized he didn't care. He felt only that he belonged fully and completely. The boys grew older. Quay grew four inches in one summer, while Cujo grew muscle. His legs and arms rippled so that sweat flowing down them looked like cresting waves. He became known far and wide from his wrestling prowess. Older boys from neighboring villages were brought to challenge him, and still he won every match. Eh, Quay! When will you wrestle me? Cujo asked. Quay had never challenged him. He was nervous, not of losing, for he knew he would lose, 
but because he had spent the last three years carefully watching and knew better than anyone what Cujo's body was capable of. The elegance of Cujo's movements as he circled around his opponents, the mathematics of the violence, how an arm plus a neck could equal breathlessness, or an elbow plus a nose meant blood. Cujo never missed a step in this dance, and his body, both forceful and controlled, awed Quay. Lately, Quay had been thinking about Cujo's strong arms encircling him, dragging him down to the ground, Cujo's body on top of his. Get Richard to wrestle you, Quay said, and Cujo let out his exuberant laugh. After the snail race, the boys had started to name everything, good or bad, Richard. When they got in trouble with their mothers for saying something crude, they blamed Richard. When they ran the fastest or won a wrestling match, it was thanks to Richard. Richard was there the day Cujo had swum too far out and his strokes had started to fail him. It was Richard who wanted him to drown, and Richard, who had saved him, helped him to regain his rhythm. Poor Richard, I would destroy him, all, Cujo said, flexing his muscles. Quay reached over to squeeze Cujo's arm. Though the muscle did not give way, he said, Why? Because of this small thing? Eh? Cujo said. I said, This arm is small. I feel soft in my hand, brother. Without warning, quick as a stroke of heat lightning, Cujo locked Quay's neck into his arms. Soft? he said. His voice was hardly more than a whisper, a wind in Quay's ear. Careful, friend. There's nothing soft here. Though Quay was losing his breath, he could feel his cheeks flushing. Cujo's body was pressed so close to him that he felt for a moment that they were one body. Each hair on Quay's arms stood at attention, waiting for what would happen next. Finally, Cujo let him go. Quay took in deep gulps of air as Cujo looked on, a smile playing on his lips. Were you scared, Quay? Cujo asked. No. No? Don't you know every man in Fontyland is scared of me now? You wouldn't hurt me, Quay said. He looked straight into Cujo's eyes and could feel something in them falter. Quickly, Cujo regained his composure. Are you sure? Yes, Quay said. Challenge me, then. Challenge me to wrestle. I won't. Cujo walked up to Quay until he was standing only inches from his face. Challenge me, he said, and his breath danced on Quay's own lips. The next week, Cujo had an important match. While drunk, a soldier in the castle had boasted that Cujo could never be able to beat him. Black people fighting other black people is not a challenge. Put a savage against a white man, and then you'll see. One of the servants, a man from Cujo's own village, had heard the white soldier's boast and reported it back to Cujo's father. The next day, the chief arrived to deliver his message personally. Any white man who thinks he can beat my son, let him try. In three days' time, we will see who is better. Quay's father had tried to forbid the match, saying that it was uncivilized, but the soldiers were bored and restless. Uncivilized fun was exactly what they craved. Cujo came at the end of that week. He brought with him his father and his seven brothers, no one else. Quay had not spoken to him since the week before, and he found himself inexplicably nervous, the feeling of Cujo's breath still present on his lips. The soldier who made the boast was also nervous. He paced, and his hand shook as all the men of the castle looked on. Cujo stood across from his challenger. He looked him up and down, assessing him. Then his eyes found Quay in the audience. Quay nodded at him, and Cujo smiled, a smile that Quay knew to mean, I will win this. And he did. Only a minute after the match started, Cujo had his arms wrapped around the soldier's fat belly, flipping him over and pinning him down. The crowd roared with excitement. More challengers stepped in, soldiers whom Cujo defeated, with varying degrees of ease, until finally all the men were drunk and spent, and Cujo alone was unruffled. The soldiers started to leave. After congratulating Cujo loudly and raucously, his own brothers and father also left. Cujo was to spend the night in Cape Coast with Quay. I'll wrestle you, Quay said when it looked like everyone had gone. The night air was starting to move into the castle, cooling it, but only a bit. Now that I'm too tired to win? Cujo asked. You've never been too tired to win. Okay. You want to wrestle me? Come catch me first. And with that, Cujo broke into a run. Quay was faster than he was in the early years of their friendship. He caught up to Cujo at the cannons and dove toward him, locking his legs and pulling him down to the ground. Within seconds, Cujo was on top of him, panting heavily while Quay struggled to turn him over. Quay knew he should tap the ground three times, the signal to end the match, but he didn't want to. He didn't want to. He didn't want Cujo to get up. He didn't want to miss the weight of him. Slowly, Quay relaxed his body, and he felt Cujo do the same. The boys drank in each other's gazes. Their breathing slowed. The feeling on Quay's lips grew stronger, a tingling that threatened to draw his face up towards Cujo's. 
Get up right now, James said. Quay didn't know how long his father had been standing there watching them, but he recognized a new tone in his father's voice. It was the same measured control he used when he spoke to servants. And Quay knew, though he had never seen, to slaves before he struck them, but now there was fear mixed in. Go home, Cujo, James said. Quay watched his friend leave. Cujo didn't even look back. The next month, just before Quay's 14th birthday, while Ephia cried and fought and fought some more, going so far once as to strike James across the face, Quay boarded a ship bound for England. I heard you back from London. Can I see you, old friend? Quay couldn't stop thinking about the message he'd received from Cujo. He stared into his bowl and saw that He'd hardly eaten any of the porridge. Fifi had already finished one bowl and asked for the other. Maybe I should have stayed in London, Quay said. His uncle looked up to him from his meal and gave him a funny look. Stayed in London for what? It was safer there, Quay said softly. Safer? Why? Because the British don't tramp through bushland finding slaves? Because they keep their hands clean while we work? Let me tell you, the work they do is the most dangerous of all. Quay nodded, though it wasn't what he meant. In England, he'd gotten to see the way black people lived in white countries. Indians and Africans who were packed twenty or more to a room, who ate the slop the pigs left behind, who coughed and coughed and coughed endlessly all together, a symphony of sickness. He knew the dangers that waited across the Atlantic, but he was knew, too, the danger in himself. Don't be weak, Quay, Fifi said, staring at him intently. And for just a second, Quay wondered if his uncle had understood him after all. But then Fifi returned to his porridge and said, Isn't there work for you to do? Quay shook his head, trying to collect himself. He smiled at his uncle and thanked him for the meal, and then set off. The work wasn't difficult. Quay and his fellow companymen off official duties included meeting Badu and his men weekly to go over the inventory, overseeing the bomb boys who loaded the canoes with cargo and updating the castle's governor with news of Badu's older trade partners. Today, it was Quay's turn to oversee the bomb boys. He walked the several miles to the edge of the village and greeted the young Fanti boys who worked for the British, shuttling slaves from the coastal villages to the castle. On this day, there were only five slaves bound and waiting. The youngest, a small girl, had messed herself, but everyone ignored it. Quay had grown accustomed to the smell of shit, but fear was one smell that would stand out forever. It curled his nose and brought tears to his eyes, but he had learned long ago how to keep himself from crying. Every time he saw the bomb boys set off with a canoe full of slaves, he thought of his father standing on the shores of the Cape Coast Castle ready to receive them. On this shore, waiting or watching the canoe push off, Quay brimmed with the same shame that accompanied each slave's departure. What had his father felt on the shore? James had died soon after Quay went to London. The ship ride there had been uncomfortable at best, harrowing at worst, with Quay's alternating steady between crying and vomiting. On the ship, all Quay could think about was how this was what his father did to the slaves. This was what his father did to his problems. Put them on a boat, ship them away. How had James felt every time he watched the ship push, push off? Was it the same mix of fear and the shame and loathing that Quay felt for his own flesh? His mutinous desire? Back in the village, Badu was already drunk. Quay said hello and then tried to move quickly past him. He wasn't fast enough. Badu grabbed him by the shoulder and asked, "'How's your mother? Tell her to come and see me.' Eh? Quay pursed his lips into what he hoped looked like a smile. He tried to swallow his disgust. When he accepted his assignment here, Ephia had cried out, begging him to refuse, begging him to run away, all the way into a shanty as his never-known grandmother before him had done, if that was what he needed to do in order to escape the obligation. She would fingered the stone pendant on her neck as she spoke to him. There is evil in that village, Quay. Baba, Baba is long dead, Quay said, and you and I are both too old to still believe in ghosts. His mother had spit on the ground at his feet and shook her head so quickly he thought it might spin off. You think you know, but you don't know, she said. Evil, it's like a shadow. It follows you. Perhaps my mother will come visit soon, Quay said now, knowing that she would never want to see Badu. Though his parents had fought mostly about him, it was obvious to all that they had cared for each other. And though a part of Quay hated his father, another part still wanted ardently to please him. Quay finally freed himself from Badu and kept on walking. Cujo's message repeated in his head, I heard you're back from London. Can I see you, old friend? 
When Quay had returned from London, he too had been too nervous to ask after Cujo, but he hadn't needed to. Cujo had taken over as chief of his old village. And they still traded with the British. Quay had recorded Cujo's name in the castle ledgers nearly every day when he was still working as a writer. It would be easy enough now to go see Cujo, to talk as they used to, to tell him that he had hated London, as he had hated his father, that everything about the place, the cold, the damp, the dark, had felt like a personal slight against him, designed for the sole purpose of keeping him away from Cujo. But what good could come of seeing him? What one look, would one look have him back where he had been six years ago, back on that castle floor? Maybe London had done what his father had hoped it would do, but then again, maybe it hadn't. Weeks went steadily on, and still, Quay sent no answer to Cujo. Instead, he devoted himself to his work. Fifi and Badu had numerous contracts in Ashantiland and further north. Big men, warriors, chiefs, and the like, who would bring in slaves each day by the tens and twenties. Trade had increased so much that the methods of gathering slaves had become so reckless that many of the tribes had taken to marking their children's faces so that they would be s distinguishable. Northerners, who were most frequently captured, could have upwards of 20 scars on their faces, making them too ugly to sell. Most of the slaves brought to Quay's village outpost were those people captured in tribal wars. A few were sold by their families, and the rarest kind of slave was the one that Fifi captured himself in his dark night missions up north. Fifi was preparing himself for one such journey. He wouldn't tell Quay what the mission was, but Quay knew it had to be something particularly treacherous, for his uncle had sought help from another Fonti village. You can keep all the captives but one, Fifi was saying to someone. Take them back with you when we split up in Dunkwa. Quay had just been summoned to his compound. Before him, warriors were dressing for a battle, muskets, machetes, and spears in hand. Quay moved further in, trying to see the man his uncle spoke to. Ah, Quay, you finally come to greet me, eh? His voice was deeper than Quay remembered, and yet he knew it immediately. His hand trembled as he had it held it out to shake with his old friend. Cujo's grip was firm, his hand soft. The handshake shook, took Quay back to Cujo's village to the snail race, to Richard. What are you doing here? Quay asked. He hoped his voice didn't betray him. He hoped he sounded calm and sure. Your uncle has promised us a good mission today. I was eager to accept. Fifi clapped Cujo's shoulder and moved on to speak to the warriors. You never returned my message, Cujo said softly. I didn't have time. I see, Cujo said. He looked the same, taller, broader, but the same. Your uncle tells me you haven't yet married. No. I married last spring. A chief must be married. Oh, right, Quay said in English, forgetting himself. Cujo laughed. He took up his machete and leaned closer into Quay. You speak English like a British man, just like Richard, eh? When I have finished up north with your uncle, I will return to my own village. You are always welcome there. Come and see me. Fifi gave one last cry to gather the men, and Cujo went running. As he sped off, Cujo glanced back and smiled at Quay. Quay didn't know how long they would be gone, but he knew he would not sleep until his uncle returned. No one had told him anything about the mission. Indeed, Quay had seen the warriors go out a handful of times and never questioned it, but now his heart thumped so hard it felt like a toad had replaced his throat. He could taste every beat. Why had Fifi told Cujo that Quay wasn't married? Had Cujo asked. How could Quay be welcomed in Cujo's village? Would he live in the chief's compound? In his own hut, like a third wife? Or would he be on a hut in the edge of the village alone? A toad croaked. There was a way. There was no way there was a way. Quay's mind raced back and forth with every thump. One week passed, then two, then three. On the first day of the fourth week, Quay was finally summoned to the slave cellar. Fifi was lying against the wall of the cellar, his hand covering his flank as it oozed blood from a large gash. Soon one of the company doctors arrived with a thick needle and thread and began sewing Fifi up. What happened? Quay asked. Fifi's men were guarding the cellar door, clearly shaken. They held both machetes and muskets, and when so much as a leaf rustled in the woods, they would clutch each weapon tighter. Fifi began laughing, a sound like the last roar of a dying animal. The doctor finished closing up the wound and poured a brown liquid over it, causing Fifi to stop laughing and cry out. Quiet, one of Fifi's soldiers said. We don't know how many have followed us. Quay knelt down to meet his uncle's eyes. What happened? 
Fifi was gnashing his teeth against the slow-moving wind. He lifted an arm and pointed to the cellar door. Look what we have brought, my son, he said. Quay stood up and went to the door. Fifi's men handed him a lamp and then moved aside so he could enter. When he did, the darkness echoed around him, reverberating against him as though he had stepped inside a hollow drum. He lifted the lamp higher and saw the slaves. He didn't expect to see many, for the next shipment was not set to arrive until early the following week. He knew immediately that these were not slaves the Ashantis had brought in. These were people that Fifi had stolen. There were two men tied together in the corner, big warriors bleeding from minor flesh wounds. When they saw Quay, they began to jeer and twee, thrashing against their chains so that they broke fresh uh, flesh, bleeding anew. On the opposite wall sat a young girl who made no noise. She looked up at Quay with large moon eyes, and he knelt down beside her to study her face. On her cheek was a large oval-shaped scar, a medical mark James had taught Quay years before, before he'd shipped him off in England, a mark of the Ashantis. Quay got up, looking at the girl still. Slowly, he backed away, realizing who the girl must be. Outside, his uncle had passed out from the pain. The soldiers had loosened their grips on their weapons, content that no one had followed them. Quay looked at the one closest to the door, grabbed his shoulder, and shook him. What in God's name are you doing with the Ashanti king's daughter? The soldier lowered his eyes, shook his head, and did not speak. Whatever Fifi had planned, it could not fail, or the entire village would pay with their lives. Every night after that night, Quay sat with Fifi as he healed. He heard the story of the capture, how Fifi and his men had stolen into Ashanti in the dead of night, informed by one of their contacts as to when the girl would have had the fewest guards around her. How Fifi had been slit around like a coconut by the tip of her guard's machete when he reached for her. How they had dragged their captive south through the forest until they reached the coast. Her name was Nanaya, and she was the eldest daughter of Ose Bansu, the highest power in the Ashanti kingdom, a man who had commanded respect from the Queen of England herself for his sway over the Gold Coast's role in the slave trade. Nanaya was an important political bargaining tool, and people had been trying to capture her since her infancy. Wars had been started over her, to get her, to free her, to marry her. Quay was so worried, he didn't dare ask how Cujo had fared. Soon, Quay knew. Fifi's informant would be caught and tortured until he, to until he told who had taken her. It was only a matter of time until the consequences came to meet them. Uncle, the Ashantis will not forgive this. They will... Fifi cut him off. Since the night of the capture, every time Quaid tried to broach the topic of the girl to gauge Fifi's intention, the man clutched his side and grew quiet, or told one of his long-winded fables. The Ashantis have been angry with us for years, Fifi said. Ever since the time they found out we traded other Ashantis brought to us by some northerners Badu found. Badu told that me then that we trade with the ones who pay more. It is the same thing I told the Ashantis when they found out. The same thing I told you. Ashanti anger is to be expected, Quay, And you are right that it is not to be underestimated. But, trust me, they are wise where we are cunning. They will forgive. Fifi stopped talking, and Quay watched as his uncle's youngest daughter, a girl of only two, played in the yard. After a while, a house girl came by with a snack of ground nuts and bananas. She approached Fifi first, but he stopped her. With a level voice and a level gaze, he said, You must serve my son first. The woman did as she was told, bowing before Quay and reaching out with her left hand with her right hand. After they had both received their fill, the girl left while Quay watched, and they measured the sway of her ample hips. Why do you always say that? Quay asked once he was sure she had gone. Why do I say what? That I'm your son. Quay looked down, spoke so softly that he hoped the ground would swallow his sound. You never claimed me before. Fifi split the shell of a ground nut with his teeth, separating it from the nut itself and spitting it onto the ground before them. He looked towards the thin dirt road that led away from his compound and towards the village square. He looked as though he were expecting someone. You were in England too long, Quay. Maybe you have forgotten that here, mothers, sisters, and their sons are the most important. If you are chief, your sister's son is your successor, because your sister was born of your mother, but your wife was not. Your sister's son is more important to you than even your own son. But Quay, your mother is not my sister. She is not the daughter of my mother. And when she married a white man from the castle, I began to lose her. And because my mother had always hated her, I began to hate her too. And this hate was good at first. It made me work harder. 
I would think about her and all the white people in the castle, and I would say, my people here in this village, we will be stronger than the white men. We will be richer too. And when Badu became too greedy and too fat to fight, I began to fight for him. And even then, I hated your mother and your father, and I hated my own mother, and I hated my own father too for the kind of people I knew they were. I suppose I be even began to hate myself. The last time your mother came to this village, I was 15 years old. It was for my father's funeral, and after Ephia had gone, Baba told me that because she was not truly my sister, I owed her nothing. And for many years I believed that, but I am an old man now, wiser, but weaker. In my youth no man could have touched me with his machete, but now— Fifi's voice trailed off as he gestured to his wound. He cleared his throat and continued. Soon, all I have will help to build in this village will no longer belong to me. I have sons, but I have no sisters, and so all that I have helped to build will blow away like dust in a breeze. I am the one who told your governor to give you this job, Quay, because you are the person I am supposed to leave all of this to. I loved Ephia as a sister once, so even though you are not of my mother, you are the closest thing to a firstborn nephew that I have. I will give you all that I have. I will make up for my mother's wrongdoings. Tomorrow night, you will marry Nanaya so that even if the Ashanti king and all of his men come knocking on my door, they cannot deny you. They cannot kill you or anyone in this village because it is now your village, as it was once your mother's. I will make sure you become a very powerful man, so that even after the white men have all gone from this gold coast, and believe me, they will go, you will still matter long after the castle walls have crumbled. Fifi began to pick a pipe. He blew out of it until white smoke formed little roofs above the pipe's bowl. The rainy season was coming, and soon the air would start to thicken, and the people of the Gold Coast would have to relearn how to move in a climate that was always hot and wet, as though it intended to cook its inhabitants for dinner. This was how they lived there, in the bush. Eat or be eaten. Capture or be captured. Marry for protection. Quay would never go to Cujo's village. He would not be weak. He was in the business of slavery, and sacrifices had to be made.